to the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast with Borg, Betts, and a baller. Welcome in, boys and girls. It's Wednesday, June 21st here on the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Borgannoni, and I am joined by two vacation boys, is Jason Moore and Andy Holloway. Oh, let me tell you something that just <laughs> happened uh, for everyone listening. Usually, we have one of us uh, three ballers here. Borg bets in a baller. That's how the intro says it. And last week, the ballers were on vacation, and Borg yeah. bets, you held it down. It did a great job. And uh, now, we're back with two of us, but one of us is making his debut on the Dynasty show, Mr. Andy Holloway. But the thing I want to reveal is that Andy is used to being the host of the show. <laughs> this is so weird. And when the intro music was going and it was ready to say hello and bring us in, the the swallowing of air that Andy had to do while you spoke, Kyle, was, <laughs> was just marvelous to witness. Uh, I don't even know what what a person says at this point in the show. I normally am handing it off to somebody else to, to do their introduction, but I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I mean, usually it, it's, it's, so it's just Borg and two ballers today. Yeah. Yeah. Usually Mike comes in with a little riff. There's, I'm just showing you this side of the table. I know you're oh, not used to it. Yeah. Right. Now you're going to have to have some restraint here because I, I get, I'm the captain of this I show. Know. I know mm. you're the captain now. There's going to be a lot of fights on today's show. I love it. <laughs> What if you now, say something I, stupid? Do, do we still? Oh, we will make. We fun still of jump them. in. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, for sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, just, just dogpile. Do what you need to do. Right. Uh, on this show, we're going to be talking about the NFC storylines. Andy is still grimacing when he said, "On this show, he's like, I'm supposed to do that part. Uh, I'm good. I'm just along for the <laughs> ride. I won't say what you told me before the show, but uh, the essence of it was just, you know, sit back, relax. You've got yeah. this." I'm I'm driving the ship. Jason was just on a ship. He can share some of those Alaskan insights. You came back with a nickname too. Uh, yeah, Quatch. The, the Quatch. My my Sasquatch hat uh, from Did you Alaska. See, uh, somebody on on Twitter went to the uh, AI banks and made a nice a Sasquatch wearing a pair of glasses that looked very similar to yours. Yeah, it was the Shimmy Squatch. I yeah, think was no, the it was it was pretty good actually. Looked like a Pixar movie. Do you feel good morphing into this personality at this point of your life? Have you embraced it yet? I, I, honestly, you know, the big shimmy, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, the double stuff, I don't, you know, hardly eat those. But Sasquatch? Now that's a man I can relate to. Oh, you're in on Squatch? I'm in on, on the Quatch? Squatch. On the Quatch. On Quatch, yeah. Mike shortened that up. But, uh, yeah, you went cruising, and I was out in the sun, and Mike was... In the rain, I think is that what is I correct. heard. Yeah. Well, we got now, some time away. We got to get real here. Who gained more weight? Oh, me. I know that there was some eating done. No, it was me. I don't care what Andy says. I have factual evidence. It. Uh, I was very pleased that. Um, I mean, I ate too much, and I felt very bloated and fat and bad about myself. Um, but I was pretty happy that when I went, one of the last things we did was we went zip lining. We were in Hawaii, and they have you jump on the scale there. And I was <laughs> ready for the, I was ready to be surprised and it wasn't as bad as it could have been. I, I didn't, you know, it wasn't as low as it was before the trip, but it wasn't too bad. <laughs> I had a similar scale, uh, story for my trip. Slightly different though. Different result. Yeah. So I went on a zip line on like day one and I oh. had, to, I had to be at a certain weight by the time I got on the cruise, which I hit. But then on the last day of the cruise to go down the slide on the ship, they weighed everyone. They weigh in. you? Yes. I've never seen like that before. Like a water slide. It's like a line of people come and weigh in front of everybody. And then so they weigh me. I'm eight pounds more than the beginning of then the cruise. Then the zip line? Yeah. Whew. And that was in swim trunks. I am. Uh, That's I'm a in smart need move, of... though. Zip line first. So you pass the test. Exactly. I didn't I... know they weighed people for water slides. That's a little bit. Did you get to go on the slide? I was allowed to go okay. on the slide, yes. Right. Now, is it a coincidence that I've been here two weeks in Atlanta and I've dropped five pounds? 
No, no, no. That's not a coincidence at all the way we eat here at Ballers Headquarters. On the show, like I mentioned, we're going to be talking NFC storylines, the top five storylines that we're going to kind of break down from a dynasty perspective. You know, we'll talk about some of our ranks, some of the strategy, but looking at the NFC last week, Betts and I looked at the AFC. If, if you want to go back, listen to that episode, you can do that. Also, up to date all the time is the ultimate draft kit. This past week, while the ballers were away, we got to update different players. When James Robinson got cut immediately, we got to change things in our rankings. So, we love the Ultimate Draft Kit is live. It's with you throughout the summer. And for Dynasty, the Dynasty Pass is fully in there. It's fully loaded. I have a quick question for us, and I threw this out on Twitter. And the the bevy of answers that I found were just so different across the board. Like some people were, would say, it's clearly this. This is the value. And that's what I love about Dynasty. We get to talk about different players and talk about where they're at. So Calvin Ridley is a mystery. He's a mystery man, 28 years old. He will will be playing his rookie contract and finishing it out at age 29, which is insane to talk about. But I'm curious which, how you guys value Calvin Ridley. I put a poll out there on Twitter, and I basically asked, in a super flex league, how do you value Cal- Calvin Ridley? Is he kind of a mid-first round pick, late first round, maybe a second round pick? Or is it one of those things where it's like, I'm just staying away I don't know what to do with Calvin Ridley. So how are you guys handling him right now in Dynasty? I'm not making big bets on Calvin Ridley. I acknowledge the upside is there. And perhaps I have been a bit burned by the optimism around wide receivers essentially returning to form because there have been, obviously last year, Allen Robinson is a historical failure. Um, but there, there have been some other players, you know, Odell Beckham. Never quite returned to form, and I know that was off of injury. Calvin Ridley without Julio Jones uh, at the beginning of the year before he took his break, it wasn't what we had hoped for, and it's been a long time. So me personally, in in a league like this, I'm not willing. I don't have enough conviction, I guess I should say. Yeah, that's fine. To make a huge bet on it, I acknowledge the range of outcomes is enormous, and I think he could land right in the middle of it. I think he could be... He could not deliver for the for the uh, the bullish crowd, um, uh, but I you know Jason is on the side that really believes. Um, I think he could just kind of be okay, and I and so I don't want to make that big of a bet. Would I trade an early second round pick in a in a super flex? Probably not. Maybe late second would be my line. Yeah, I, I think your line is pretty similar to mine. I do believe that Calvin Ridley has a good year. Like I'm betting on him in redraft. But for dynasty purposes, obviously the bet on redraft for him right now is already a gamble. You're you're, you're taking a risk. There's so much unknown with him, but he just needs to be good this year, and Trevor Lawrence needs to step forward for for that bet to pay off. But if that does, you know he's going to play this year at 29 years old. So even though you know it feels like oh he you know he hasn't played that many years in his career, well he came into the league old. He obviously has missed a lot of time with injury and suspension so now you're talking about a dynasty asset that if he hits if he comes through on all of the variables and checks every box and is very good you probably have a two-year window that's what i was thinking too and that's that's got its place that's got its value but it's it's not a you know i'm certainly not trading you know a first round pick for calvin ridley and i think that there are people that will be doing that so if i have calvin ridley I would probably right now the hype and the unknown and the coming back and Trevor Lawrence like I, I I think maybe you could actually shop him around and just see if someone is willing to pay up for him um, if you're in a dynasty format. Yeah, I mean it was What's, 2020 when we last saw vintage Calvin Ridley, right? So yeah. we're going three years since then. So he could do it, but I feel like trading that high of a pick means he has to do it. You you mentioned, Jason, the two-year window. The hardest part is his contract because he's not guaranteed to be tied to Trevor Lawrence beyond, beyond this year. So it's tough, and we're also banking that he's going to be the wide receiver one for this team when we just saw Christian Kirk turn in a wide receiver one season. So at the end of the day, it's a gamble. If you are bullish and you're in a win-now mode, I don't mind. If you just want to trade back of the first, if you say, hey, this is going to be the 111, the 112, 
and you're trying to get yourself somebody who's a wide receiver two, can be a wide receiver one for your team. So uh, we had a ton of votes on there, but I did see some interesting trade offers. So I want to gauge this real quick before we get into our main segment. Would you rather have in Dynasty Calvin Ridley or Deontay Johnson? Um, the, the, sorry, I, I got distracted because I was, I was looking up the contract information and it's so funny to remember that right now Calvin Ridley is playing on his rookie contract. He's, he is entering this season on his fifth year option of his rookie deal in the year 2023. Um, okay. What was the question? It was Deont it was Deontay or, um, Deontay or Ridley. Or Ridley. Which, who would you rather have? Uh, I'll take Deontay. Yeah, I'm going to take... 26 years old? Yeah, I'll, I'll take the age of Deontay Johnson as well. Okay, Ridley or Brandon Ayuk, who is going to be in his fourth year with the 49ers, has a fifth year. That's not... It's Ayuk. Yeah, it's not even a, a question to me. It's Ayuk uh, running away. Yep. Yeah, and I, I think for 2023, people are valuing Ridley higher than those players, but we're talking about Dynasty Outlook, so I think I would agree with you guys too. Ridley, what if you, what if you threw in a couple of uh, veteran... Uh, names in dynasty like Keenan Allen or Mike Evans. Do, are you taking eye. Ridley above those two players? Here, or are are you staying? <laughs> so th those are great names. Uh, when my I my two starting wide receivers. When I was old men. Yeah, well, I, I was looking at my rankings uh, in preparation for this, and M Mike Evans was the player that I had a really hard time saying. Would I rather have Mike Evans or Calvin Ridley? Because, you know, you've got Mike Evans is going to be playing at 30 years old this year. Yep. Presumably, assuming he stays on the same team, which they've been talking contract extension, without any legitimate quarterback. Um, so that's where I think I might take the gamble and go to Ridley. But uh, I wouldn't blame anyone for saying, well, look, Mike Evans is just – he gets it done every year. He's a stud. Nine, nine straight thousand-yard seasons entering year 10. Yeah, I mean, the quarterback situation is obviously in favor of Calvin Ridley. Uh, Calvin Ridley is a year younger, but you haven't seen him. That, that That's that's the coin flip. I would land on the Calvin Ridley side. Evans I'm, counts $23 million against the cap this year. I'm personally contractually obligated to say Keenan Allen every single time, <laughs> no matter what. So I think you guys already know that. But you guys know, so Evans, Ridley, almost the same age, and... Evans has played almost like 80 more games than him in their careers. Third contract for Evans, rookie contract for Ridley. <laughs> right. It's, it's pretty That's wild. That's wild. All right, let's get into the main segment. Storylines. Now, yeah. I'm going to ask you a question, yeah. boys. Do you remember that that was a segment for the show? Uh oh! Do I remember that it was a segment for today's show? Yes. No, but for the main show. No, so that not at all. We have not used that on the main show. That, Is that, that was for a real segment from. Wow. Oh yes. Now one of my favorite things when I get to be dun, captain of the dun, ship dun, is just dun, to, dun, dun, dun. to dig deep and find segments that we haven't done in a long time. Sometimes they don't even match up. I think Jason's been on one of those shows before where they just don't even match up. But that one did. Um, last time we did it was 2018. So wow, it's been a while. Uh, You're last the, week, Kyle's the archivist of yes, the fantasy footballers. Yeah. And now, what am I tracking this year? The, I mean, this last year was Jason's shirt. That that's kind of what you guys need to know is that as we've gotten through, you know, half the year, there's some good material in the main show. So I'm still tracking it. Uh, yeah, the people. Yeah, definitely don't track my moves. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, J Jason commented on his. Earlier in March, he talked about his, his boobs on the show. Mm. Yeah, well, that's a topic that comes up when you get around 40. Um, no, I Jason's stats were incredible with the shirts. Wasn't it like four blue shirt, dark blue shirts and then the rest were all black other than costumes? Yeah, yeah. Um, what was incredible is j in preparation for my vacation, I went through my closet. And I got rid of I, – I just had so many shirts. I just haven't gotten rid of clothes in apparently a decade. And so I just went through every single shirt and like, would I wear this today? No. Would I wear this today? No. You know, just donating, get, getting stuff to Goodwill or whatever. And in the end, when I looked at my closet, <laughs> it was one color. It was black. It was black. That's wow. all I got left, yeah. baby. 
Yeah, that's uh, that it's a gamble when you take the black out into the Arizona sun. Worth I mean, it because you're making the choice. Worth it. Mm. Jason, one time we were in a pickleball tournament together, and we both wore orange. Yeah, I think that's the only time I've ever seen you. Yeah, I got rid of that shirt too. <laughs> <laughs> I did too. Um, on this show, we will be talking about the NFC storylines. Last week, we talked about a term, team ecosystems. Really, we're just saying that each team has an environment for dynasty that we have to think about. It's more than just, I like this player. I think they'll be good for two to three years. It's what are the contracts for the team? What were their offseason moves? You know, Do they have a different offensive coordinator? What are the trends? What is the outlook? Is it a different coaching staff? So all of those things make up a team's ecosystem. So last week we talked about rookie quarterbacks and what they do for fantasy. So, you know, with CJ Stroud's there and Will Levis and Anthony Richardson all in the same division, that's going to influence how we look at other players. I wanted to start off by talking about the NFC and their quarterbacks because half of the conference, which is wild, half of the NFC will have a different starting quarterback in week one than they did last year. Like, it's pretty pretty wild when you look at the conference and just the turnover. So, for instance, Arizona, I just wrote down, not Kyler. It doesn't seem like it's Kyler. Could be Kyler, but probably has a different quarterback and could have a different quarterback next year. Atlanta has Desmond Ritter. Carolina, Bryce Young. Green Bay, Jordan Love. New Orleans has Derek Carr. San Francisco, probably Brock Purdy. Uh, the Buccaneers, I just wrote, not Tom Brady. And then Washington will have a different starting quarterback for week one. What do you guys make of that in just terms of the their turnover at large? And then we'll talk about the implications for Dynasty. Well, I, My first reaction is this is not a laundry list of big names arriving in the NFC. This isn't Aaron Rodgers signing a new deal. You know, he's a big name arriving in the AFC. This is not Brady, you know, in his transition to Tampa from New England. Uh, you know, it, it's a bunch of unknown names taking over at the helm. It's enough names where you're looking at the NFC and saying, is Jalen Hurts the best quarterback in the NFC? He could be. Is Matthew Stafford a top five? Probably. Like, when you look at the quarterbacks themselves, there aren't a ton of world beaters in the NFC. There's a lot of question marks or retreads or rookies. And so, uh, you know, it makes me a little concerned. You know, we were on the on the main show talking about, you know, doing our mock draft episode a couple days ago. And you're looking at Adam Thielen. Or Jonathan Mingo in Carolina, and you go, oh, they're attached to a rookie, rookie quarterback. I don't know about that. You talk about Kyle Pitts, who Jason really likes, is oh, he's attached to Desmond Ritter. I don't know about that. Oh, what about Romeo Dobbs and Christian Watson and the out and the breakout? Oh, he's attached to Jordan Love. I don't know about that. So t to me, there's a lot of question marks that are brought by these quarterbacks. That's what stands out first yeah for me what what stands out is um the, the reality for dynasty leagues and i think this is even more important in superflex dynasty leagues to realize that these back-end quarterbacks the last third of the league you know your your bottom tier starters they are they are garbage to be recycled uh they they, <laughs> they go in the blue bin and you, you don't need to worry that much in your dynasty leagues about you know a lot of times people hoard quarterbacks in super flex leagues uh, i've seen you know five six you know they got every backup and uh, trying to scrounge and 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 find someone but you look at this name this list of names and you're saying you you can get these guys for nothing and every year there's going to be new starters kyle you had a stat that I think is 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 really telling over the last five years. Why don't you give that? Yeah, at least over the last five years, at least 10 quarterbacks who were week one starters were not that team starters the next year. All right. That the average is 11.6. So that's a, thir a third of the league at least. Right. Yeah. And Jason, you were on that show. We talked about Superflex. We talked about Superflex rankings. And our point that we brought up is people overvalue the safety of a third quarterback, right? They're just like, okay, I got to have that in case something happens. When it seems like a third of the league is turning over every single year, where there was a starter that you had last year, you know, Carson Wentz or whoever, you're like, okay, I've got I've got this person. It could be a QB two, and now he's, you know, chilling 
getting unemployment checks. So yeah. J- the- Jameis Winston, you know, as you forget, he was the starter last year going in <clears throat> uh, for yeah. the, for the Saints and Matt Ryan. Goodbye. Right, and and those those is Matt assets, Jones a long term asset? I don't know, but <laughs> it, it, just ask yourself: Is he in the top two thirds of the quarterbacks playing right now? Because no, that's a good yeah. Because if, if you're not the the then odds on then you're, you're Teddy not, Bridgewater. You're not starting next yeah, year. You're Carson Wentz, Bridgewater, and in a Winston. super flex league, I think people overvalue that third quarterback where if he's a starter and he's you know I'm not saying people are you know at the beginning of last year people were clamoring for Sam Darnold no of course not but he had more value than he brought to the table over the course of last year and now not being a starter so if you've got these guys that are you know this list of guys loosen the grip on those I'm saying if you've got Desmond Ritter if you've got uh you know, Sam Howell, if you've got some of these guys that are gonna be thrust into starting roles and teams are like, I I I value that third quarterback, I value a starter, capitalize on it. Right. Capitalize on the guys who have very short term starting windows. Fair enough. It's so hard because you want like if you're a contending manager, you're playing for the safety of a third quarterback. Like, okay. But we talk all the time, like, hey, if one of your starters goes down your team's screwed. Like if if you have Josh Allen and he goes down for your team in Superflex and you're thrusting in Sam Howell or I don't know, Desmond Ritter, can he pick your your team's probably toast, right? So, I think managers most of the time play it safe in Dynasty in Superflex leagues because they want to do that and they want, but the reality is barring it from my friend Jason, um you kind of end up not having that asset a year or two later. So just keep that in mind. Uh, there's a lot of turnover. There's turnover every single year. Let's take a quick break and we'll come right back. Hey everyone, a real quick reminder. The ultimate draft kit is available right now. It is the only tool that you need this off season to dominate your draft. Uh, we know you're going to spend all off season here, all the, this summer getting ready for that draft. Well, get ready with the Ultimate Draft Kit because we keep this thing updated each and every single day. When some news breaks, we're jumping on the computers, we are adjusting our projections, and we're making sure that you have the most accurate, up-to-date information getting you ready for those drafts. And if you want to go a little bit deeper, there is the Ultimate Draft Kit Plus. That includes the Dynasty Pass that we reference all the time on this Dynasty podcast. You also get our DFS product, which the guys Borg and Betts, they're gonna look it's DFS for the rest of us. We we get it at an affordable price and we make things easy for you to jump on FanDuel or DraftKings, wherever you want to play, and just have a good time and up your chances of winning. Just you know, it's a little little bit of quiche, some side quiche over there. So check it out right now, ultimatedraftkit.com. All right, we're back, and I need I need to vent about the Lions because I try to do that, and I try not to be so mean, but the NFC North is one of those divisions that looks completely wide open. When we look at this conference, and we look at this division specifically, it's been the Packers through and through, year after year, as just, we know we can pencil them in, we know that Aaron Rodgers owns most of these teams. So historically, it was the Packers division, last year Minnesota got hot, and they won a bunch of close games. Detroit is the current betting favorite and Chicago. I guess I wrote down they have nowhere to go but up because it was pretty bad record wise. But when you look at this division, before we talk about the players and the changing dynamics, like, do you think this is the Lions division to win or are people already crowning them too early? I don't love that they're the betting favorite (laughs) because they do feel like the, they feel like one of the biggest traps to me because, um, of expectation and uh, the dependency that they have on players that have not always been, uh, you know, Jared Goff is your centerpiece on offense and he had a good year and maybe he'll have another good year, but there is still, I don't, you know, Jameson Williams being out for the beginning of the year is concerning. Uh, They've rebuilt their entire running back room. Like there are places that could just not work the way that we foresee it. So um, I think their betting favorites is more a reflection on doubts about Minnesota and Green Bay than it is 
a, a higher endorsement of them than maybe we had last year. Yeah, I mean, the, the Lions, they were everyone's favorite team to root for last year, mine included, and it was awesome to see them get close, unfortunately not make it into the playoffs. And so now it looks like this is their window, this is their opportunity, but the NFC North is a division that is – not owned right now it's 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 a land grab minnesota last year what, what did they win didn't they win like or yeah, 14 games 13, 13 games they were a 13 win team and i realize they're they weren't as good as their record no and they're worse this year having released alvin cook having lost some defensive pieces um but they're still probably um i mean they are just a much better organization you know t top down and then you've got the Packers, who've always been a very well-run organization. Obviously, you go well; they've had, you know, they've they've had Aaron Rodgers. But there is a world where the first-round draft pick, uh, you know, in, in love, is actually decent. Now, I'm not saying he's a Hall of Famer, but if he's good, then that team wins this division. I don't. Yeah, I was going to say I don't think that Chicago can win the division. No, but I think the other three teams are all in play. Which, when I look at the betting lines, the fact that the Packers are the um, the least favorite to win the division, that to me seems like, you know, if you're want, if you're a gambling man, um, yep. you know that that would be where I find the most value, not necessarily the the highest odds. I, you know, Minnesota being plus two fifty to win the division, uh, they they feel like they could easily win the division again. Betts and I, we went through this earlier on the DFS and betting podcast, but just, wow, it seems like a major discrepancy that people are already crowning the Lions as the team that's going to win this division. I don't know if you saw uh, Guns Mahoney's quote the other day where he was talking about what this period is in uh, in terms of practice and offseason. He calls it a pajama party because there's no pads. Which, yeah, uh, I mean, that is, that's uh, <laughs> what that amount of caffeine w would call it. It, it is it is really funny. Um, I was reading through, uh, Kyle, I believe you, you shared the ESPN article of all of the first-round draft picks and how they're progressing, how it's looking. And when you read through top to bottom, every single team's players and how they're doing, it was like, oh, you know, how how's Bryce Young doing? How's all these offensive players? It was like, here's, here's how it's going for them. And then every time it got to a defensive player, it was like, we have no idea. Because they can't do anything. Like, there's no pads. There's no tag. Like, we have no idea if they're good or not. They're just don't they're, they feel, they're good in meetings. Don't they feel like the a little bit of the Browns uh, division winning hype of the year in which I believe you picked against them, Jason? Yes. Yes, they do. And and usually when you bet against franchises, and I'm speaking as a Cardinals fan, uh, the bet against. You, with no judgment, just reality. No judgment whatsoever. I root for the underdogs. I love the Lions organization the floor or the Lions fans falls out but from those teams when the organization is not a historically well-run organization you it's a, just bet against them because it's a good <laughs> bet unfortunately you, I, I'm rooting for them actively like I want the Lions to have a fabulous season I want them in the playoffs I wish they were there last year um just like I was rooting for the Browns to have success but but I think the point is fair where it's like there's a lot of ways it could go wrong. So, so with this division being wide open, what what are you know dynasty fantasy outlooks on how it can go differently for uh, you know it, it, these teams can go both directions. Like all four of these teams could go both directions, and so where do we find the value in uh, maybe long term upside within the NFC North? I think your point about Jordan Love is a really interesting one because his progression as a quarterback if we view him differently three games into the season everything changes for how you view Christian Watson I think Aaron Jones is being undervalued in fantasy drafts and in dynasty formats right now I have tried to trade for him in dynasty leagues. in dynasty in really? dynasty leagues yes even if it's a short window to me I did try to trade with you were we, we close I can't remember not close at all no no, no. well that makes sense with my my history of offers <laughs> But but I mean like are you actively shopping Aaron Jones? Yes, we're we're rebuilding and I think it's to me there's a window there of elite play that nobody wants to acknowledge in dynasty. Like what if I, he's more of this offense than he's ever been before? He does have 2 years left on his deal and while I do think they could cut him after this season that would that would cost 12 million in dead cap. So 
if he plays well this year, they might just say, well, let's just keep him on his last year of his deal. Yeah, I, it's just how much elite play are you, you know, you're not going to get five years. And I know that's the excitement around Jameer Gibbs and stuff like that. But we haven't seen him on a football field. We've, we've seen Aaron Jones dominate for years. And if this one, – one of the points about the Green Bay offense that was brought up, and I'd, I'd give credit if I could remember where the tweet was, but they were talking about how slow Aaron Rodgers was running this offense and that a lot of the production that you may lack, you know, from – the, the efficiency difference between Aaron Rodgers and Jordan Love could easily be made up for in faster play on offense with Jordan Love, which I think will, would be to his advantage. If the offense ran a lot faster with Jordan Love, you're going to put defenses in a position where, you know, Aaron Rodgers was picking teams apart with his recognition and with that slower play. And I think Jordan Love is going to be able to take advantage of a faster pace and that we could be looking at Green Bay's offensive weapons with so much regret when the season begins if we if it goes well, a different direction. It it's definitely a buy window for Aaron Jones, twenty eight years old. Last year he had his highest targets per route run of his career because he they had to utilize him when they were kind of rebuilding their wide receiver core and AJ Dillon's in a contract year. So like Jason said, like this could be a two year window for a player that's yes, a bit older, and we're kind of scared off right now by other running back contracts and other running backs not getting, but he has the money. So I, I, I think I agree with you. I saw that same article that talked about the pace and everything else. So I, I, I like them there. My question is the other quarterbacks in this division. Like this is a contract year for Kirk Cousins. Who knows with Jared Goff? So it's really hard when you think of these elite weapons on Minnesota and Detroit, like Jefferson, Amon Ra. Who's their quarterback in 2024? Like, that's a giant question mark. So how are you viewing, for instance, the Vikings pass catching options, knowing that Cousins might not even be there next yeah, year? Yeah, Cousins won't be there next year. I mean, I, I don't think um, I, I don't know many franchises that hate their quarterback as much as the Minnesota Vikings hate Kirk Cousins. The problem is he's milk toast. He's clearly their best option. He's good enough to win games. He's good enough to get to the playoffs. He's good enough to win a playoff game or two. Um, I don't but, think that he can come back under any circumstance other than a Super Bowl yeah, win, yeah, which would be 50-50. 100%. I mean, if they, if they won the Super Bowl, they would sign him. They would but I don't think a, him. I don't and, think a conference championship no, appearance would get him back. No, it, it, Kirk Cousins is not going to be back. They're going to be looking for... Um, someone new either on the trade market or free agency or drafting. Uh, the problem is they're, they're probably, because of Kirk Cousins, not going to be in a position to draft a high-level rookie quarterback. So, yeah, I mean, there are worries here for the long-term, not long-term, but like two years from now, three years from now, the offense in Minnesota, I think, could look much different. And because we're talking about how wide open this division is, you know, Minnesota, who won the division last year, it's – in the realm of possibility that they they're last place this year. I mean, anybody in this division could be last place. I don't think that's crazy to say. And if if that happens, then yeah, you you've got questions about Justin Jefferson going forward. That you know maybe you towards so, the end of this year try to capitalize on on a Justin Jefferson window. I mean, that's hard to do. He's the literal first pick in all dynasty leagues. He is the one on one. He's unbelievably valuable. He's young. He's the best wide receiver in the game. But if he had a lull for the next two or three years with some other mediocre or rookie quarterback, if you capitalize on that max value halfway through this season at your trade deadline, um, it could be the, you know, the best way to uh, play the market. Uh, real quick. Stepping into the host shoes for two seconds, I'm asking you both where you rank this. Like, put the division in order how you think it'll finish. Because I would take Minnesota to finish on top this year, Detroit, Green Bay, Chicago. That is my exact order. Okay. I think I would put in the same order. The only thing I'll add is that Minnesota has a first-place schedule, so it's it's tough. Like, it's going to be a different schedule than they had last year. Uh, but, man, the Packers, just from betting, I, you mentioned earlier, that's just so tempting to bet them at plus 500, just throwing that in there. But, yeah, it's wide open. I, I mean, just throwing this at the very end, but Darnell Mooney, Cole Komet, they're in contract years for the Bears. So, like, every team, when you think of, like, their core players, like, and you attach Justin Fields to these players, 
it's not a guarantee a year from now or two years from now that they're part of that group. So keep that in mind. The ecosystem, you can get all of that in our team opportunity pages in the Dynasty Pass. But I want to change gears and I want to talk about old running backs because they die fast. And I feel like this offseason has brought this to the forefront. Like more than anything, this is like one of the biggest storylines across the NFL over the last couple of months. Saquon Barkley, uh, Jonathan Taylor last week was talking about, you know, his contract extension. But there's this cold reality that, you know, Jason says all the time, but mama, you don't want your kids to grow up and play running back in the NFL because it's short. And we're seeing the change of guard, especially in the NFC. Like, let me give you a list of these names and where they've been over the last five, six years. Like Ezekiel Elliott. He's only 27.8 years old. Like he's the same. He's actually younger than Aaron Jones. And since 2016, the most running back fantasy points in all of football. So like this has been a key cog for somebody else or for, for people as managers. Alvin Kamara, same exact age. Is that Zeke? Yeah, that was Zeke. Oh, yeah. Doing him dirty. That's mean. I, I feel actually, I feel bad for Zeke at this point, but Brooks would tell me, and this is what Brooks says all the time. Oh, he's already made a bunch of money in the league. You don't have to feel bad at all. <laughs> is that the fo- the focus Brooks has? Sometimes well, I mean, Brooks uh, and money, they kind of go hand in hand. That's true. That's fair. One time I said I felt bad for Carson Wentz, and he just was like, dude, that guy's made so much money. You don't have to feel bad at all. Um, I mean, it's it's kind of true. <laughs> it's kind of true. They're fine. Alvin Kamara, all right? So since 2017, the most running back fantasy points in all of football, all right? So if you can get all of that in our career consistency tool. You look up every single player and what they've done their whole career. Like these have been the top dudes. Aaron Jones has been an RB one for four straight years. Only Nick Chubb's the only one that do that. So there's a changing of the guard at running back. And in Dynasty, Jason's talked about this a couple times on the show. And I know Andy, you've capitalized this in your own leagues, but you'd rather be a year or two early on these players to trade them away than be left holding the bag. So I have Dalvin Cook in a league. And I have no idea what to do with him because nobody will trade for him right now. Yeah, you, so, you, you're holding the bag, brother. That's what it feels like. It's, it's over. Th- that is what holding the bag is that. It's sitting there with no one wanting them. I, I, Andy, you had Dalvin Cook on your dynasty team. Uh, you had Dalvin Cook on your dynasty team this, this offseason, right? I had. Had. Oh, you didn't, you're oh. not holding the bag? No, I, I managed to move him in advance. Of this circumstance for uh, little Josh Jacobs, I had to had to throw in another player too. Yeah. But but look, it's not. Um, I think the tendency, at least for myself, and not everybody's the same in how they look at their dynasty roster. But it seems like the objective so often is to kind of build out a roster that you can kind of like almost put on autopilot, right? Not not as though you wouldn't be active in your league, but you're trying to to get some players that you think have a prolonged um, run of success. And so you're trying to find this, okay, I'm going to build my super team and I'm going to let it run and be build this dynasty. And that's just not how it works. It does not work that way. And it, it doesn't work that way at all at running back. Yeah. That position is a turnstile and you don't see players like this even, they don't ever reemerge. Like Zeke is. Uh, here's a, here's a spoiler. He's not reemerging. He's not, no matter you put him in the best situation out there. He's not reemerging. The in best that situation. situation. The best situation for Zeke is he goes back to the Dallas Cowboys and he gets because of that relationship and <clears throat> known commodity. He ends up getting a lot of work and volume, and he's a running back two for fantasy. I mean, last year he wasn't that great. He was the running back what nineteen. Um, and and he got a ton of of use. So yeah, I mean he the, the, none of these guys are getting better in their career. No, and and they just don't. And running backs, you reach a point where you're you're a declining return for the team, and you're at the most expensive you ever have been because your your contract is progressing to more advanced stages. So they are all going to be in this point at you know, and this is 27 years old. You should have new running backs on your dynasty squad every year or at least every two years. You don't I, – I mean, the way that I view it, I think you're right, Andy. Like, the running back position is one that you need to be active every offseason. Every offseason. In, in refurbishing your home. I like that word. Refurbish your running back room. 
Put something new up on the walls every year. Repaint. Yeah. You know how valuable painting is? You know how dusty that room will get? And how fast it'll get covered in cobwebs? Paint paint your room. Paint that running back room, Kyle. What if I told you I refurbished that Dalvin Cook roster by trading for Alexander Madison? How do you feel about that? What'd you give up? It was the 112. Uh... And and I'm saying the 112 as if I win this next I, year. I'm oh, so it's just a first rounder. I'm gonna, and you can't win because I'm in that league. I'm champ, champ, champ three years in a row in that league. That's not the 112. I'm going to I'm going to approve it under the previous discussion of needing to refurbish the room. I'm not as big of a fan of Madison being a yeah. long term dynasty solution as as some people might be. Um, just because I don't believe in the talent the same way that others. Uh, seem to, but I'm going to approve the move because you are you're you're sprucing up that room and you need to, because who knows where Dalvin Cook is? Although, did like- you see the Dalvin Cook? Speaking of of him, he had uh, liked the McCa- uh, Pat McAfee post about how exciting the room is in New York for the mm-hmm. Jets. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jason, yeah, you want to speak on that? Yeah, Which is I the do. second time he's been. Connected um, to the Jets. Yeah, the, the 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 that would be sad for me and for Brees Hall. Um, but Brees Hall would absolutely unequivocally overcome Dalvin Cook. My, I, I think the Brees Hall thing would, and even Jonathan Taylor at this point, um, Javante Williams, more case studies in there is no autopilot. Because if you would ever think an autopilot exists, Brees Hall last year, you could have put him on autopilot, but injuries happen, so you got to refurbish your room. Um, recovery from injury, veterans coming in, committees, everything changes so fast. We talked so last sell, week. About what you jo- do is you sell the autopilot in Dynasty. Right. You sell that in trades. You you make the case of you're getting a guy that you can lock into your roster for five years. Yeah. Sell that dream because that dream, the dream is a lie. Yeah. You got a timeshare. Get out of it. Yeah, sell that timeshare. It is a timeshare. And the maintenance fees add up. Uh, and I, I've said this before, but, y- you know, the the way that I prefer to approach it is if you can get a young guy in his rookie contract. Um, you know, I, I just traded for uh, – I, I got Brees Hall. I traded for Travis Etienne coming this year. I want to get – like Travis Etienne, a good year this year. He's going to sign a, a new contract. I'll play one more year. I'll get two years out of him. And then he's still going to be very young with a lot of years left on his deal and very valuable. And I will get out of that timeshare. Yeah. Find a, su- Let's find about- a sucker. <laughs> Let's talk about some players, though, that are entering that contract year discussion in the NFC. So we talked about the old dudes. But Saquon's under franchise tag. Tony Pollard's under franchise tag. Cam Akers, A.J. Dillon, DeAndre Swift, Antonio Gibson, all these guys in the NFC that could be on different teams this next year. So, one, do you think any of these guys get a legit second contract, and are you trying to trade for any of those guys right now? Dude, I look at that list. Jason, I don't know how you feel. I feel like the only one that could surprise and genuinely get a good second contract is Antonio Gibson. I think he could actually get one and be a team's choice to be their running back in the off season. I don't think it happens with Dylan Swift or Acres. Yeah, if you're if you're uh, ignoring the franchise tag guys, right? Um, That's what I was. Then yeah, yeah you're, you're you're probably right. I do think that a player like Cam Akers, th- there is value in dynasty to one year windows. Um, if you can buy a player for the year that it, you're coming up on and just score a lot of fantasy points for uh, an asset that people don't want. And I think a lot of teams don't want Akers. A lot of players are, are down on Akers. Now, that his uh, range of outcomes is very drastic, and so managers have very different outlooks on him. You might have a manager in your league that is like, um, I, I, I love Akers. He's going to have a great year. I want to I keep him, or I, I would only sell him for a lot. But you might have someone that just is like, oh, man, I can get something for Cam Akers? Great. Um but I would agree with you. I, I, honestly, I don't think any of those players get any kind of significant uh, future contracts. If I had to put my money on one, 
it would be on Akers just because he is still young and has the opportunity for the Rams to like have an impressive season. I don't know that Antonio Gibson gets the opportunity to impress the rest of the league, but the franchise tag guys like Saquon will get another contract. It won't be phenomenal, um, but you know he'll he'll end up going to some poorly run franchise for a lot of money so that they could sell tickets and you know he'll go to the Texans and make his money next year if if they don't get a deal done I mean I could still see him signing a deal this year with with the Giants with teams that are competing these are the type of running backs though that you can get cheaper on one year windows like Antonio Gibson right now like I traded for him in a league and it was a second and I feel totally fine saying I get a year and then I probably get a second contract from there. Where a second, we've talked about on the show, the hit rate is so low that I'm willing to punt that off because I consider myself a contender and I need to bolster my running back room. So my point is saying these are the running backs that you can trade for. I'm not saying it's the right move, but if you hit the right one for a year window and they get a second contract, then you've bolstered your value and you've helped yourself yeah, for this I mean, year. So, what you do is you go to your public channel, your public communication hub for your league, and you just mention broadly, like, oh, man, you realize Antonio Gibson is in the final year of his deal or whatever, whoever you want. Oh, Cam Akers is playing his last year of his contract. And then two days later, you go and you make that trade offer. You plant that seed. You let it sprout in that manager's head like, oh, man, it's a, it's his last year. Oh, I got to get something for him. And then you come capitalize for cheap. Should I just assume that anytime you two post something in the league, that you have an ulterior motive. Yes. Jason, for sure. <laughs> the, the problem is in our leagues, everyone, every it's impossible to trade. Everyone thinks we know something we don't. We don't. We share everything we know on, on, publicly and as quickly as we possibly can. But if we try to trade for anyone, they're like, oh, he, he knows something. Yeah, it, it has really backfired over the years because we don't have anything you don't know because we do a podcast yeah, where, where we, we share, share it, it. Yeah. yeah and we don't lie on here no we don't i do remember no. early on like er, very early. very like early first on. few episodes like no first year first oh season. boy no it, not that i did but, but the I, temptation the temptation yeah. to just i was like oh this is gonna affect my league i don't want to share this there were times for sure in the first year where i was like i have a take and I'm going to tell it on the next yes, show. Yes, I got to make my trade offer. I got to make the trade offer first. We don't do that anymore. It's no. been we, we, that that's been over for better part of a decade. I don't believe that. I, do, no, I, I don't believe no. it. it We're here for it's the book unfortunately land. true that it's over. Uh, unfortunate for my teams. Let's change gears. Talk about a couple more topics, and one that you guys are familiar with: the NFC West that is coming off some major quarterback injury woes okay so Matthew Stafford uh basically almost retired we thought he was going to retire we thought McVay was going to leave Brock Purdy and his injury uh Trey Lance if we want to throw him in there and same thing with Kyler Murray so in this division that is in flux talk about Geno Smith's the, division yeah Geno is the one stable thing that we can say who uh none of us said was the starting quarterback last year like it's crazy to think that Drew Locke was universally seen as the guy that was going to start in best ball leagues everywhere. 100%. At this time last year, Drew Locke was the starting quarterback. If the trade had gone through, I don't I don't remember the exact timeline, but it was it was all the way up through middle to late training camp before people started to consider that Geno could actually win the job. It's true. So, let me throw out the Rams first and then we'll work our way to the Cardinals and you guys can just let it all hang out. Um the Rams what type of window do you give Stafford, Cup, McVay? Because it feels like a really fragile situation when you look at a team that they could just say, I'm done. Like, I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. They're just collectively as a team, they say, like, we, we, we're done. McVay's out. Like, it's, it's weird in Dynasty to look at this team beyond 2023. So, Andy, what are your thoughts? How are you handling Stafford, who I think is undervalued right now? But who knows if he plays in twenty? Yeah, he's undervalued in a one-year window, I think, because you're not going to – I'm not going to presume re-injury right now. And he was the quarterback five in 2021 with McVay and, and Cooper Cup is there and reports this morning about Van Jefferson looking good. And they have 
Like they're going to, you know, Tyler Higby, they're going to be better than advertised on offense if Stafford is healthy this year. But you're right. I mean, they, there could be a an exodus, right? You could have a simultaneous departure of Stafford, McVay, Donald, um, you know, Cup could want out at that point to play for a contender. And, uh, you know, that's a huge risk in Dynasty. But, I mean, I think that's been the kind of the message of today's show is that, you know, if a third of the league's quarterbacks disappear every year and running back windows are two years and and then, you know, there's just a lack of predictability in the long-term success and we don't want to be caught on the other end of it either. We don't want to be in the position like we were with Seattle where, you know, you, you devalue Cooper Cup so much in the future on the presumption that they're going to have a – uh, a Drew Lock start in the, and then you get a Geno surprise, and you know DK Metcalf's dynasty value, he was a steal for those that hung on and hung through. Uh, Tyler Lockett's in the same boat, so you know, and that's why I, I would disagree with Jason's Justin Jefferson take earlier, where I know you weren't prescribing it, you were saying this is an option, but someone like that, that's at that tier, I'm just writing it. And I'm going to expect Minnesota because Minnesota could they could have a bad quarterback. Minnesota could also be in the position of the, you know, get lucky with a Jalen Hurts style guy in the draft. You could have the Russell Wilson acquisition, which I know it didn't work out for Denver, but a high profile acquisition in the offseason. Minnesota is historically desperate at that position. You know, they they go out and they made the deal with Kirk Cousins, which was unprecedented. Before that, Brett Favre, Case limited Keenum. limited time. So, you know, there there's they try to fix it, is my point. You talk about them as a franchise being more stable than Detroit. So I don't want to overemphasize the fact that they could dis disappear, but I'm looking at them through a one year lens right now. Yeah, I mean, I think most people are. Most people look at the Rams and they say that they've got one year with Stafford and Cup and um, that, that this could all just implode and go away. I don't believe that. I trust great coaches. And Sean McVay is a great coach. He won with Stafford. He won with Jared Goff. He, he's, he's retooled this team. He hasn't been there for a three-year window of success. Sean McVay's records, 11 wins, 13 wins, 9 wins, 10 wins, 12 wins. And then this last year, five wins. Had a quarterback injury, dealt with a lot of injuries, and and they, you know you thought, oh, he they might walk away. They decided to come back. <laughs> you know they they're not coming back to lose. That's not their goal. They're not trying to rebuild and tear it down. They're trying to say, hey, I ain't going out like that. I'm going to show that we're great at football. And this is an aggressive franchise. I mean, you look at how many times they you know they trading for Stafford. Who knows what m moves they're going to make before the season and mid-season. So I I find myself betting on the Rams' offense for being better than what the current presumptive value is. There's a world where all all the core pieces of that offense outperform the ADP this year. In fact, they, you know, I yes. could see that sh showing up on a Bold Predictions episode. You know, Akers, Stafford, Van Jefferson, Cooper Cup, Tyler Higby, which mm -hmm. Jason's brought up a couple of times. I think all five of those players could outperform ADP. Yeah, they're a fun team right now in best ball. And then I, I do agree. It's kind of the collective opinion that no one knows what to do beyond this year. But Cooper Cup, I'm not worried about, you know, I think you have at least two to three years where you can get still the high end production. Let's go to the 49ers because based on the betting markets, they're seen as like in a tier with the Eagles but we're assuming a lot at the quarterback position. We're assuming a lot that things keep rolling. Their main core guys are under contract for a couple of years. You know, like they're they're good when it comes to McCaffrey, Debo, Kittle. Uh, Ayuk has two more years, so they have all of that. I think the contracts will come knocking in two to three years. But you have a window, and if Brock Purdy's the guy, do you feel like with the 49ers, you feel stable and secure with Purdy, or is it like? He's still a question mark in your mind. I don't even care. I don't care about Brock Purdy and whether or not he's the guy. They're all going to be great. They're the best team in the NFC to me. 
And I don't care. I, they'll figure it out. They've figured it out with so many different quarterbacks over the past few years. If it's Sam a, Darnold is the quarterback, they're going to be they'll just be great. fine. That's a, 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 perfect. Couldn't be a better example. They will make him better, and the players will be fine, and they'll win 13, 14 games. And if Brock Purdy is it, oh, my gosh, watch out. Cherry on top. Yeah, he was throwing so, you know at least two touchdowns a game in his window of winning now he didn't have the strongest competition he was playing against but Kyle Shanahan uh, yeah he's a, he's a good schemer um my issue with this offense is really just that I don't I, I think they they have such a good defense and they're such a good team and they run the ball so well that when you look at how many options there are to pass the ball to and split it you know C Christian McCaffrey is a receiver as well and so when you've got him and you've got Debo and you've got Kittle and you've got Ayuk and you don't need to throw the ball a ton because you're not down a lot and you're closing out games with the running game, it's very difficult for me to want to invest in those pieces. But to answer the question of like how do we view Brock Purdy's injury affecting the receiving game, very, and, very little. Yeah, and I guess it's more of like saying no matter what quarterback there is, those issues will still exist. Yeah. So – you know, I don't think Purdy is going to change the fact that some weeks Brandon Ayuk is eating the biggest piece of the pie and Kittle and, and those guys. I just think they're going to be a really, really good team, and I like betting on those. I heard you say, buy Sam Darnold. That's what I heard. I think that was a direct quote. I think that's what Jason said. Get I Sam. never know what I say, Sam so Darnold. I'll trust you guys. Uh, no, I, maybe you were hearing uh, last year, was it? Two years ago? <laughs> it. It's a good point, though, to bring up about this team and that they're just a train. They're, the, the way that they scheme things, but the, tight, the, the touchdowns overall will probably be spread out more than we want, like you mentioned. Let's finish with the Cardinals here, and you guys can just let it all out. Kyler's return is up in the air, so what do you got? I mean, you have boots on the ground, so what is your sentiment of not just Kyler's return, but the... Okay. That's definitely how you've been feeling for years. He said, let it all out. Now, this is just about the organization as a whole, not Kyler. That is correct. Okay. And yet that is Kyler too. Because when you give a contract to a player like that, you don't, you don't normally find yourself in the position of wondering if they'll be the quarterback next year. And that is the actual situation for Arizona. There's a there's a, a chance he's not the quarterback for the Cardinals, and that is Caleb Williams, and that they move on. It's it's hard because the pieces that you could invest in in Dynasty right now, you don't really know where they're going, and then you're asking yourself the question, if they get another rookie quarterback, is, am, is it resetting the timeline? So Hollywood's in a contract year. You know, Connor's under contract for what, two more years? Uh so even the other pieces, I still feel like I don't know what to do with them. So how do you guys view some of those guys? Yeah, the, the, you, you're taking a gamble, but it needs to be an informed one, right? You need to know what the options are. Hollywood Brown is a young player who now without Hopkins is thrust into a wide receiver one role, and he has succeeded in that role whenever given the opportunity to do so. I think he will be very good this year. Uh, but the Cardinals have two projected very high draft picks two at least top 10 picks could be two top five picks could be the first and second pick in next year's draft in which case you've got you know uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. Yep, he, he comes to the Cardinals and all of a sudden Hollywood's long-term outlook is a good so you just need to you know say what you believe is going to happen and a lot of that's going to be based around Kyler right if Kyler comes back a little earlier if Kyler is good this year if he plays well and they win more games. Well, they won't be in the same position to to draft those players with their own pick. And so, you know, you're kind of wondering what you do on the bet with Kyler. As far as our boots on the ground and information, I keep looking. I keep searching. I want more information on the timeline, on the recovery. All the pictures look I, good. The workout videos look good. But I, I really add, don't know. Yeah, I mean, I would add that this team has been ex exceptionally supportive of Kyler from an from an organizational standpoint this off season, like even though we don't know whether they would move on, if that opportunity presented itself because of the record, 
the the way that the organization is behaving is that they want Kyler to be the guy for the future. Um, from Monty Austin Fort to Jonathan Gannon, uh, it, it seems as though they have rallied around him. They've supported him off the field. They have, uh, you know, he's been at the uh, at the facilities all hours this off season. So, you know, if I'm a betting man, I'm betting he will be the quarterback for the future. But I just don't it, know how this season's going to go. It's a phenomenal point you're making, Andy, because I haven't really put all of the pieces of information that we know about together to just realize how incredibly invested they are in Kyler in his success you know right before the draft they got flack because head coach and general manager flew out to an event to support Kyler and yeah, said, oh, Oklahoma. what are you, what are you yeah. doing uh, th who did they draft in the first they trade back up in the first round to draft the guy that Kyler said he wanted at left tackle they are they are all in on Kyler, and, and it's not just those two moves. It's a lot of things. So I would agree with you. I, I don't think this whole Caleb Williams number one pick, I think if we get the number one pick next year from the Texans, we trade that pick and we keep Kyler. TBD, but I mean, sure. look, yeah. look what the Bears did, I mean, right? injury is the is the kind of the, the elephant in the room. You know, if, if Kyler attempts to come back, gets re-injured, we end up with the one number one pick. All bets are off. You know, whenever you have a team with a top five pick potential, which the Cardinals have – two top five pick potential, you're going to have that question mark there. But at least thus far, like you don't go out and support him the way you have if, you're, if your long-term plan is to move on. No, and, and, and I believe what they're going to do is, is what the blueprint of the Bears did in, in supporting Justin Fields, trading their high-value pick, getting a haul, being able to now put weapons around their quarterback. And we've already got – we as the Arizona Cardinals have a better core – around uh Kyler than than what Justin Fields had prior to that trade so to me the best investment one of the best purchases in all of dynasty fantasy leagues Superflex or regular is getting Kyler Murray right now because he will never again be as cheap as he is right now being injured not knowing if you're even going to be there to start the season he is going to be good. He is a very young, very good player. If you look at the data on fantasy points per game, it doesn't get much better than Kyler. I mean, you're you're talking about only the elite of the elite. Only the Mahomes and the the Hurts and the Josh Allen are actually better on a per game basis than Kyler. And And this you, is even into last year, just to to speak to that briefly with the actual numbers, Jason. Sixty six percent completion percentage, on pace for over four thousand yards. On pace for 29 total touchdowns uh, with just 11.9 uh, interceptions, high QB rating. Rushing yardage, dual Yeah, threat. 700 yards on the ground pace. And, and there is no fear, zero fear at all about his long-term future. That's ridiculous. Even if it's on another team. 100%. Yeah. It has nothing. If he goes to another team, he's going to be great for fantasy. So this is the only window where you will have a discount on Kyler in Dynasty um, uh, you know, obviously, assuming he doesn't get a totally new injury uh, a year or two into his career, but um, I, I, I've been saying this for months. Um, that no, I, you, you have spoken of the buy opportunity. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I do think Kyler, uh, you know, and and Superflex even more so, uh, just because of the value of quarterbacks. I took your advice, Jason. A couple, it was a month ago. And I traded for Kyler in a super flex. And the point was that if he's the Cardinals quarterback or a different team's quarterback, I think I got him for 75, 80 cents on the dollar. And so that's the, that, that conviction for me was, was that point. Cause is he the Cardinals quarterback next year? I think, but if he's not, he's young, he's a franchise quarterback. And I think we'd all agree on that point. Yeah. His contract isn't going away. Someone's trading for him. You know, <laughs> they're not going to draft Caleb Williams and have Kyler as the backup. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that world doesn't exist. So some no, not team, with that contract. No, some team would have to be saying, you're our franchise guy. We're super excited to have you. We're totally invested in you. We're taking on that contract and trading picks for you. Fair. All right, last, last topic we're going to talk about for NFC storylines is the big trades that happened in the NFC. Uh, the Eagles traded for DeAndre Swift. The Bears traded the number one pick and a lot of other things and got DJ Moore. The Cowboys got Brandon Cooks. And the Giants have Jaron Waller, who I just found out is under contract for four more years at 30.8 years old. So 
looking at these trades that change destinations, talking to dynasty managers, which of these trades do you think change the outlook of the player the most? Or do you look at these players as the exact same for dynasty? Obviously, DeAndre Swift, you you had to trade the world for him two years ago, and now people are begging to take him. So did your outlook change on these players after they were traded? Uh, uh, one of them for me. Which one? Darren Waller. Interesting. I, I, I get that. I feel like um, the window was like on its way to being closed. And then the trade may have just like cracked it open for a couple more years, and let the breeze in. I I'm actually pretty confident he'll be their target leader. Yeah, I, I've got him statted out as the leader in targets. They they don't have a dominant wide receiver, and he's coming from a team that had Devonte Adams. He's perfect for Daniel Jones too. I mean, when you're that size, you're just gonna make plays. Yeah. So the the other deals, uh, DJ Moore. I don't think it's a great landing spot for him. I believe he continues to do what he has been doing, which is valuable for fantasy, but not as valuable as you want for fantasy. So I don't I don't really view a big change there. Brandon Cooks, he's a great one year rental if that's how the managers are feeling about him. I think he can make some noise in Dallas. I don't think he lost it. Um Do you look I, at him as a you know, DJ Chark arrived in, in Detroit last year? And made some plays early in the season. Is that the? That's exactly it. But but a much better version. He's okay. a better player than DJ Chark. Uh, you know, is Brandon fair. Cooks has been a long term really good option, and now he goes from, you know, bad, awful, putrid, number one overall pick worthy quarterback play to Dak Prescott. You know, if he's he, and he's not the number one, you're telling me he can't get open down the sideline when defenses are focused on Ceedee Lamb. Yeah, that's fair. What about Swift? I, I find that in our rankings and where we have Swift on the site is very different than I think what a lot of people feel like they still have. Like they still have the same cologne smell of DeAndre Swift from a couple years ago where they had a top asset. He's only 24 years old, but he's in the final year of his deal. And I think the assumption is he's the RB1. Like in best ball right now, he's the RB21 off the board. And we don't have him ranked there at all. So are we just kind of down overall on just the running back room behind Jalen Hurts? It, no, it's a, I, I, go ahead, Jay. Yeah, it, to, to me, uh, there's a, a big difference between uh, Dynasty and Redraft for Swift. I believe the way that we have statted out Swift, all three of us, is not very rosy. We're, we're pessimistic in our outlook. We all recognize that it could work very well for him. Miles Sanders just had a great season. They can run the ball. This is a great offense. If he ends up uh, getting you know, the, the lead of the market share there, he'll have fantasy value this year. But this is a franchise that would never give DeAndre Swift. Like, Let's say DeAndre Swift has a good year. Best case scenario. He has a good year for fantasy, a good year for the NFL in 2023. He will be gone. There is no world where the Philadelphia Eagles are spending free agent money on a, you know, if he has a good season, he's going to actually, you know, be wanting a contract, wanting a payday for that. Eagles will say goodbye. We'll just replace you with anyone. Yeah, I mean, the the depth chart is complicated. I think we could honestly say that Rashad Penny could have the best year. We could honestly say that DeAndre Swift has the best year. I think the most likely scenario is that you see Swift, and Penny and Gainwell. and Gainwell and Boston Scott, mm -hmm. even a little bit around the goal line, um, you know, and Jason's favorite guy, Trey Sermon, uh, getting involved. No, not really on that last one, but you know, that it's just muddy. And then none of those guys are the number one running back. None of them because Jalen Hurts is. So, so it's a little bit like, uh, you know, sifting through four options in Baltimore where, where you're like, well, I mean, Jacob Dobbins should have a huge year, uh, but but like Gus Edwards could be good, but like Lamar's their running back. So I think that's what's factored at least into my statistical output is because I don't want to put too much expectation on that backfield when Swift has struggled with injuries, Penny has struggled with injuries, Gainwell has a role, um, and they don't need them on a weekly basis. They'll use them, but I think it'll be in – uh, more unpredictable. Yeah, I, I do think that if I look at my redraft uh, statistics and rankings, I'm guessing that DeAndre Swift will 
outperform where I have him ranked. I think he will be better at the end of the year, total counting stats, total fantasy points wise, than I mean, the Kyle's stats I have given him, but it will come in a very unfriendly fashion for playing and for success. That's exactly how I see it. But Kyle, you haven't weighed in on, on DeAndre Swift. I mean, despite limited activity, 114 carries, 151 carries, 99 carries, always been inside the top 24. It's, are we are we fools? Do you think we're fools? Between the twenties, running backs are just running backs that I try to stay away from. I mean, Jalen Hurts, Jason, you know he was your dude last year. Mm -hmm. He had forty three red zone carries. That was the most ever by a quarterback. Like my man, that's because you can't stop and they the man they tried, from one yard. You can't. they tried to change the rule and they didn't work. The tush push, the tush push it, at least gets one more year. More tush. That's that's what we need. Uh, but I mean, Hurts. He has games where he gets multiple rushing touchdowns, not just like here's one every once in a while. So just in terms of statting it out, I think that's why he's going to be lower. And statistically, he's never really thrown to the running back. So you're kind of getting a diet version of himself from what we wanted in uh, with the Lions. So I'm totally fine if you want to trade for him as like a flex type running back. But I think people look at the age and what he used to be and are going to ask for more. So he's at that weird place. Oh, where yeah, like, you can't get him for what you what you should be able to pay for him. We we have him, Jeremy and I, in Dynasty, and we're asking the question where it looked like he was the worst asset and we didn't want him at all, but now we're just holding and seeing if he gets another contract, if somebody else wants him at trade deadline time. Those are the type of running backs that I like to hold where you're saying the value can increase for this league. Like, I know that league. There will be people that want Aaron Jones and want DeAndre Swift for a stretch run. And we're kind of holding out. So that's that's kind of where we're reviewing him. Timelines for trades are, are really important. If you can't find a good window right now, you know, I, I talked about when, when I brought up Justin Jefferson earlier, waiting till the trade deadline because you have so much more information on the Vikings and their future outlook and maybe Jefferson's just on fire and you could get a haul of hauls of hauls. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if you can't get something for Swift now, wait till the trade deadline or, or you're near it in your league where teams are going, I can win. I can win it this year. And they will pay up. They will pay a premium to have someone that can help them win this year. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we talk about it a lot on the show, but knowing when to trade guys, when to trade picks, when to not trade picks, that's a really valuable piece of dynasty play. Yeah, and I think the bigger, I guess the bigger message with the Jefferson thought process, if I was in it, and if, if you told me, hey, take advantage of it, it would be, it would be knowing the long-term ecosystem point about the Vikings and then going into the trade deadline if he's on fire and saying, give me Jamar Chase plus a pick. Give me Jamar Chase plus a, a great player that's going to contribute because the ecosystem for Jamar Chase, the long-term quarterback play of Joe Burrow, correct, far more assured than Justin Jefferson. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, hey, you should trade Justin Jefferson. Unload him. I'm saying that if if the situation is, is right to be able to get something of asinine value, like you said, Jamar Chase – plus something. Jamar Chase's long-term outlook, two two years from now, I presume I will – I mean, right now, I think in 2024, I'll have Jamar Chase ranked ahead of Justin Jefferson. So no. Yeah, but, I mean, it could be other names too. It could be whatever, A.J. Brown, who, you know, with the long-term contract to Jalen Hurts, plus a big haul on top of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's going to do it for this show. Andy, are you, are you okay? Are you alive for – This is so easy. I mean, I love it. This is great. You just get I get to, to just football? weigh in. It, I get to talk football. It's different. Okay. I don't have yeah. a clock running in my head. It's, it's awesome. Super nice. It's super. <laughs> you just sit back, barely listen. Um, you know, it's yeah. wonderful. <laughs> All right. That's gonna do it. Join us next week on the Pain School Ballers Dynasty Podcast. See ya. Thanks for listening to the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast. If you want to take your dynasty skills to the next level, check out the fantasyfootballers.com.